Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's Meet VCU Authors event at the Humanities Research Center. My name is Chris Shin, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies here at VCU. I'm also the director of the Health Humanities Lab and the acting director of the HRC for spring 2024, while the director, Christina Stanchu, um, is on a Fulbright in Ontario, Canada. Um, I'd like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences and the incredible Ronnie Sisaveth and the Acting Assistant Director Eli Costin for their support and help with organizing and promoting this event. For those who are new to this series, our Meet VCU Authors um, invites faculty, students, and members of the Richmond community to come meet VCU authors as they talk about their recent publications and answer questions about their work. It is also a time of celebration, as we know that every book takes many years to complete. Our virtual events follow a more or less similar format. I'll introduce our guests, who will then speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. You can post your questions during and after the talk using the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. I would, I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Olivia Landry. Olivia's research spans film and media, as well as theater and performance studies. Her first book, Movement and Performance in Berlin School Cinema, explores the contemporary film movement, the Berlin School, through a recalibration of the body, movement, spectacle, sensation, and spectatorship in cinema. Her second book, Theater of Anger, Radical Transnational Performance in Contemporary Berlin, examines contemporary transnational theater in Berlin through the affective political scope of anger as an attributed uh, and justified affect that responds to social injustice. This book presents a return to political theater and a rethinking of the novel ways in which art and resistance intersect. Her latest book, a Decolonizing Ear, documentary film disrupts the archive, which she'll be discussing today, in investigates how documentary film can challenge conventions of listening and recording shaped by histories of colonial ethnography and extraction. From 2014 to 16, Olivia was a Kenneth P. Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pittsburgh. After that, she spent a year at Stanford University as the William H. Bonsell Acting Assistant Professor of German. Between 2017 and 22, she was an assistant professor at Lehigh University. Her research has been supported by grants from SSHRCC, DAAD, and the Humboldt Foundation. Olivia, congratulations on the book and welcome to Meet VCU Authors. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for the generous introduction and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, also, thank you, Ronnie, for the organization, um, seamless as usual. And also thank you to Christina for inviting me originally to, um, to present um, my, my recent book. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. All right. So there it is, A Decolonizing Ear. A uh, documentary film disrupts the archive. It was released by the University of Toronto Press in late 2022. Okay, so essentially what this book does is asks what can film do with colonial listening and sound reproduction. And um, what I'm going to end up doing in this talk is kind of really setting that up. Um, and then finally at the end to kind of get at some of my, um, some of my objects, okay? So, First of all, what is colonial listening? Um, well, I think about colonial listening uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, colonial listening entails practices uh, of listening that occur within and uphold unequal power relations. I think of colonial listening in its link to technological invention and development. I also think of colonial listening as driven by desire for knowledge and its appropriation. And Dylan Robinson calls this hungry listening, which I think is a really important um, and helpful term. I also think of colonial listening um, as an act of extraction and dispossession of language and culture, which are, and the term stolen is used quite often in, in the literature, stolen and distorted according to the logic of colonial production of knowledge. And I also think of colonial listening as a kind of sinister listening, 
Um, that is to say, listening with a certain intentionality or agenda. Now, I come from German studies. That's my disciplinary um, background. So, so I take as my prime example of colonial listening, the historical uh, event uh, of the Königliche Preußische Phonographische Kommission, or the Royal Prussian Phonograph Commission. And I've given you just a, um, a description here, which I'll read. And I noticed we have a, something in the chat. I want to make, okay, make sure that no one's asking a question or having trouble seeing the PowerPoint. Okay. So as the First World War was raging, in December 1915, one of the first major sound collection projects was initiated in Germany. With Edison wax cylinders, a cylinder phonographs, and Berliner record graphophones in hand, groups of anthropologists, linguists, language specialists, and musicologists descended upon 70 prisoner of war camps in Germany. And there were a total of um, roughly 175 spread throughout the country at the time to measure, photograph, and most importantly, record the voices of the captives. Especially targeted for study were the many colonial soldiers who had been forcibly enlisted by their colonizing powers and sent to continental Europe to battle the German Empire and its allies. And the commission was active until 1918. So, might seem obvious how this is an example of colonial listening, but let's um, think about it um, a little bit more specifically. So we have the context of militarization, of war, colonialism, and imprisonment. Prisoners of war were not in a position to decide or negotiate the scientific terms or social afterlives of the recording of their voices. We also have the onslaught of technology. So we have the invention of the phonograph in 1877, which coincided with broad colonial expansion, right? Often referred to as new imperialism. And to some extent, this kind of colonial encounter becomes a scene of technological reproduction with, of course, photography, but now also sound recording and filming. We also have um, ethnography of so-called native informants. So the scientists who um, descended upon the prisoner of war camps in Germany were not interested in what was said, right? They were only interested um, that the, or wanted the subjects to produce samples of languages to be recorded. And then, of course, you have the creation of the archive, the Berlin Sound Archive, or Laut Archiv. 1,650 recordings were made of 215 languages, right? So you have the accretion um, of objects and knowledge. Um, and here I... I I show you a picture. This is a picture that is circulated quite often um, as a documentation of the uh, Royal Prussian Phonograph Commission. Um, it is, of course, a photograph taken in the context of colonialism. I need to make that clear. Um, but I think it's an interesting picture insofar as it really um, shows us a lot of kind of um, the objects and kind of symbols that were um, very much, and also the power structures that were very much present um, during uh, this period. So we have um, these men here who were prisoners of war. And this is this photograph was presumably taken in um, the prisoner of war camp Gunstdorf in Brandenburg, not too far from Germany, uh, sorry, not too, in Germany, not too far from Berlin. Um, probably 1916. So we have the um, the men here who are waiting to essentially um, have their voice recorded. Um, these are Nepalese prisoners of war. Okay, 
And here in the, the center, we have Wilhelm Dögen, and Wilhelm Dögen was the de facto um, director of the commission and actually wrote uh, several lengthy reports about the work of the commission, okay? And um, we have someone speaking into the funnel of the phonograph, all right? And um, to the left, we have uh, the language specialists, um, Heinrich Löders, okay? And then we have the technician, of course, in the background, probably um, responsible for making sure that the machine is working. And uh, last but not least, we have the military guard, right? We have the, the presence of the, the military guard, which is important um, insofar as um, thinking about this situation and the, the coercion um, of this ethnographic work, right? It's unclear how willingly or unwillingly prisoners participated. Um, some speculate that prisoners receive small bribes, um, such as extra blankets, um, extra food, cigarettes. Um, some also suggest that prisoners welcomed the reprieve from boredom and also labor, forced labor in the camps. Um, and also uh, it's mentioned in the literature that some of the prisoners were curious about the technology. And it's interesting, you can, if you look um, closely enough, you see someone peeking through the window um, at the scene, um, curious about what is going on um, in the room. Um, okay. Oops, sorry. So what I'm interested in uh, is what happens when film repurposes or remediates audio recordings from the context of colonial listening, okay? I will come back to this example of um, the, um, the recordings made during the First World War, um, but now I want to uh, kind of take a different, um, kind of take a different route and set up um, my argument a little bit further. So first of all, we have to recognize that not all film work decolonizes or destabilizes colonial listening. Some films actually promote it. And what we see when we look at especially earlier film is this um, fascination um, or iconography of the European myth of the so-called first contact. And a number of scholars have written on this. Um, Michael Tosse calls it the double appeal of the fascination of the other's fascination with the talking machine. Fatima Tobing Roni calls it the contrast between the primitive and the modern. Uh, Asenka Oxlioff calls it the myth of the primal encounter with technology. So what we see quite often um, especially in earlier film, and I'm going to show you a few examples, is that um, this, there's a manifestation of, first of all, the interaction with the talking machine, right? Both through speaking and listening, okay? So um, the indigenous subject encounters the phonograph um, or the gramophone in specific cases. And film takes this up as um, kind of an interesting, um, especially iconographically kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, of course, very colonial phenomenon. All right. So again, I want to um, emphasize that these are filmic images that were made within a colonial context. Um, and the examples I will show you are examples of films that actually exploit colonial listening. The first of which is um, Bushman spricht in den Phonographen, or Bushman speaks into the phonograph. And this is one of the most widely known and earliest ethnographic films of roughly three and a half minutes. It was made in 1908 by Austrian anthropologist Rudolf Pöch, in what is present day Botswana. And here we note 
um, Dietrich Schiller's treatment of the film much later in 1984, when he synchronized image and sound, both originally recorded by Pöch, but on separate recording machines, okay? And um, this is unfortunately um, not a very good sample. The film itself is, is not in great shape, um, but the the sample I found online was is is even is not very good at all. And we hear a um, a French a voiceover in French. And actually, this person says that sound and um, image were synchronized in 1987, but the literature actually says it's 1984. So just so you know. <laughs> all right. So let's listen um, and watch that. Discours d'un Boschiman enregistré par phonographe. Voici un des premiers exemples d'enregistrement simultané d'images et de sons. La synchronisation de cette séquence a été effectuée à Vienne en 1987 après la découverte du cylindre de cire Edison, porteur du son original. Okay. I'm going to move along. My second um, example is Nanook of the North. And here we see actually um, an instance of coerced listening, right? So the so-called first contact is actually um, someone listening or forced to listen uh, to um, a gramophone in this case. So, and Nanook of the North is one of the most famous early documentaries by the pioneer filmmaker, uh, American um, Robert J. Flaherty. And it's often considered the first full length documentary film. It's about an Anuk man and his struggles to survive in the Canadian Arctic. In this scene, Nanook visits a trading post to sell his um, fur pelts to a white fur trader. And there he encounters a, a gramophone, apparently for the first time. <laughs> 
And of course, this is a scene that explicitly um, demonstrates this notion that um, the indigenous subject is not, you know, doesn't understand the technology, um, is not, you know, doesn't understand where the sound is coming from um, and bites into the record, right? Um, so really kind of, um, uh, and, and, not an, an, um, a critical example of um, of the so-called first contact. The final film, the final example I'm going to show you um, is actually a much later film. It's the 1982 adventure film, film Fitzcarraldo uh, by a German filmmaker, Werner Herzog. And the trope of the first contact, I should note, was not exclusive to very early film and was not exclusive to documentary footage, as you'll see. Um, Michael Tosig actually describes this film as constructed around the fetish of the phonograph. Uh, and in this film, we have um, an Irish, an aspiring Irish robber, baron, and lover of opera in Peru. And in this scene, well, and we note throughout the film that he takes his gramophone everywhere. Um, but in this particular scene, um, he uses it to, quote unquote, pacify um, the indigenous tribe on whose land he trespasses. And this particular scene has been described by, for example, Lutz Kupnik as uh, an act of acoustical colonialism. So here we really have a kind of powerful example of um, how um, indigenous sound uh, is disciplined and quote unquote civilized, right? By kind of Western um, high culture, right? Opera. Okay. Whoa. So <laughs> that was, that's still the, we're still in the introduction here. <laughs> so my book, uh, focuses on, and but I really wanted to kind of give you some examples to kind of set up what I'm pushing back against. Um, so my book focuses on those films that do destabilize or decolonize listening practices rather than exploit them. Okay. So the first film I look at is um, From Here to Here which is a, a short experimental documentary film of just under an hour, co-directed by Indian filmmaker and artist Madhusri Dutta and German filmmaker uh, Philip Schaffner. And it tracks personal histories of emigration and immigration to and from Germany and India during the first half of the 20th century. Um, it also contains the story of Mal Singh and other prisoners of war in Germany during, um, so coming back to my original um, example, uh, during the First World War, 
And this would become then the premise for Scheffner's later film, The Half Moon Files. So this uh, film was released released in uh, 2005. And then I also look at The Half Moon Files, which was released two years later. And this was directed um, by Philip Scheffner. It was his first full length um, a documentary film. And it's more in the style of, of an essay film, I should say. Um, and so far as it kind of balances between um, nonfiction and fiction, um, has certainly fictional elements. Um, and it explores the history of the First World War and German colonialism through the project of the Royal Prussian uh, phonographic commission. Um, and it calls itself a, a ghost story as it attempts to piece together the identity and fate of the prisoner of war, Mal Singh, whose voice was recorded and preserved in the Berlin Sound Archive, but of whom there are no other traces. And then I look at Bontoc eulogy. Bontoc eulogy um, by Marlon Fuentes, it takes us in a different direction. It's not a true documentary. Um, it might be better called a, a mockumentary or a docudrama. Um, it's kind of set up like a documentary, but it ultimately, um, the, the story it tells is it's fictional. It's the first film by Philippine American filmmaker Marlon Fuentes, and it is a it's really a testimonial um, about the colonial history of the Philippines and the plight of the indigenous Bontoc Igorots under colonial rule. And this film similarly scours the archives looking for clues, including sound recordings, but it it ultimately tells its own story in the style um, of autoethnography. And I think this is a really powerful image. This is actually the first image of the film. This is the filmmaker himself, Marlon Fuentes. And um, already he's subverting the trope of the, the so-called first contact, right? Um, in so far as he's kind of um, placing himself in front of the phonograph, um, but kind of purposefully, right? And then I look at um, The Tail Enders, and The Tail Enders is an American documentary by Adele Horn. It's about the organization uh, Gospel Recordings, now called Global Recordings Network. It's a Christian missionary group uh, founded in Los Angeles that uses low-tech audio devices to spread the evangelical message to indigenous communities across the globe. And then finally, I wanted to make a note of um, the film Expedition content. Unfortunately, because of its later release in 2020, I was unable to include it um, in the book. Um, but it, it, I think, is also an important example of how film can destabilize or decolonize uh, colonial listening. And this film um, by Ernst Carell and Veronica Kuzumariati um, remediates the sound recordings made of indigenous hubula uh, people uh, during the 1961 Harvard Peabody expedition to what was then New Guinea. And um, these recordings are now preserved in part in the Harvard University Peabody Museum and, and in part in the um, ethnographic uh, collection at Indiana University, uh, the ethnomusical, in the ethnomusicology department. Um, and what is remarkable about this film or what the filmmakers call a, a sound work, not a film, um, is that the, its image track is composed almost exclusively of a, a black screen. Uh, with the exception of this image I, I've uh, given you here, um, it's mostly just a black screen, um, which is really interesting. And of course, it, it really um, urges you to engage with the sound um, in important and critical ways. So what does it mean to decolonize listening? Or better, what is 
a decolonizing ear, the kind of the title of my book. Well, I argue that film teaches us how to unlearn dominant practices of listening conditioned by colonial history. Okay. Um, and how does it do this? Well, I'm going to take you through my methodology, which is informed um, through various stages um, and by um, various scholarship and theories. Okay. So first, close listening is important. And close listening is a concept um, developed, at least in this context, uh, importantly by Annette Hoffmann and Britta Lange. And these are two scholars who have worked very closely in the Berlin Sound Archive as well as the Berlin Phonogram Archive. Um, and so their work is, is very important to my own. And they're influenced um, particularly by Laura Ann Stoller's notion of reading along the archival grain, right? So rather than reading against the grain, right, uh, or reading against the archive, um, Laura Ann Stoller invites us to kind of um, enter the force of the archive and um, seek out a more comprehensive perspective, right? And she's known especially for her work um, in the, the, the Dutch colonial archive, the Dutch Indonesia colonial archive. Close listening is also listening beyond the purposes of ethno-linguistic speech or dialect identification. And this is particularly important um, for the context uh, that I've kind of mentioned, the historical context of the Royal Prussian Phonograph Phonographic Commission, because they were interested in recording uh, samples of languages from all over the world, right? Um, and they were also interested in being able to identify these samples. And um, listening, close listening is also about listening to understand what is said, or for example, sung. Um, listening for kind of semantics, right? Um, in the case of the um, Royal Prussian Phonograph Commission, um, occasion, so most of the time, actually, the subjects were given something to read aloud. Quite often, they were parables from the Bible. Um, but occasionally, and I'm going to show you um, or let you listen to an example, um, occasionally they were uh, able to just sing or um, kind of tell a story that they knew well. Um, and what becomes really interesting is listening to what exactly they're telling, right? And then there's also listening for voluntary or involuntary utterances and noises for possible moments of rupture or dissent. So for example, clearing of one's throat, coughing, laughing. Um, so these kind of peripatetic outbursts, right? Or even um, we hear, uh, you know, someone shouting out, guten tag, or salam alaikum. Basically something that would disturb the recording. You know, the scientists um, uh, in, that, in that period using, uh, for example, wax cylinders, a wax cylinder could only record three to four minutes. Um, and that was it. So basically, you, you know, you were limited in terms of your resources and you wanted to get a clear sample of uh, speech, um, you know, as efficiently as possible, right? And then, of course, of course, I look at decolonial theory, and this is just a very brief um, um, kind of summary. Decolonial theory um, takes demands a more radical approach, right? It's really about shattering the status quo. It's not about, you know, reading along the archival grain, but really um, reading um, against the archive. It's about counter normative listening practices, right? Listening otherwise is also uh, a term that Dylan Robinson uses. And of course, um, there's the importance of epistemological decolonization. So really a clearing the way for a new intercultural communication. Um, I mean, decolonial theory, at least in the context of listening, really demands that we question listening itself, right? 
And then finally, um, media archaeology. So um, media archaeology is interested in reading kind of old media, quite often analog media, right? Um, Media archaeology introduced a general distrust in history, um, and there are different kind of um, branches of media archaeology, um, but many kind of trace a path back to Michel Foucault. Um, so this distrust in history, certainly linear history. So it brings forth discrete insurgent moments of the past that defy the straight lines of historiography, right? Um, it also engages in practices of remediation, such as, of course, remediation of audio recordings through film, as we're looking at here. It attends, furthermore, to elements of materiality, technology, recording, and memory storage that typically eschews cultural semantics. So it, it does move away from close listening. Um, there's this notion of the cold gaze or the dispassionate ear, right? That's not interested in the cultural semantics of what has been recorded. Um, and it's also interested in listening to noise. And this becomes very, very important to me. So listening to the noise of the machines. I mean, uh, most famously, I think uh, Friedrich Kittler and others have spoken about the fact that when the phonograph was first invented, the, you know, the, the audio recording machine was first invented. The archive of the audio recording machine was also invented with it. Because when you start recording, you're also recording the noise of the machine. And the noise of the machine gets stored um, just by virtue of uh, recording. So um, media archaeology is very interested in listening to the noise of the machines. Okay, how are we doing for time? Oh, it's getting late. Okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't even get to my example. Oh, dear. Okay, so I will <laughs> show you one example um, of listening with a, a kind of how I approach listening um, and uh, specifically listening with a media archaeological approach. And this is um, listening to noise. Okay. So here is just one sample from here to here, the first um, film that I look at. Germany, Okay, 
So this is the audio recording of Mal Singh, which appears in From Here to Here and the Half Moon Files. Um, I say appear, but that's not the that's not the verb I want. Um, and it becomes fascinating to the filmmakers because, um, of course, it tells a personal history. It tells a personal narrative about being captured, um, about being forced into uh, being forcibly enlisted um, into fighting for um, fighting for the British Army, and um, then being captured uh, and interned in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. Um, and it's, you know, it, it expresses homesickness, it expresses the desire to return, it expresses nostalgia, and it also expresses a kind of hope, hope and hopelessness um, about kind of the state of things, the state of war. And this um, recording becomes then um, the first piece that drives um, the film, for example, The Half Moon Files, um, as the filmmaker attempts to piece together the story of Mal Singh. So what I'm particularly interested in, of course, I'm interested in the cultural semantics of the story, the close listening, I think element is very important. Um, we should listen to what is being said. We should note that the language is um, Punjabi with kind of some Hindi words. Um, I think this is all very important. But what I'm also interested in is the noise. So listening to the hums, the hisses, and the static. Um, noise is this kind of shapeless and uncategorizable thing, if you can even call it that. And it often frustrates and unsettles the listener, right? Of course, noise also depends on the ear of the beholder, right? And um, there is a, a long history of noise um, as also racialized. Um, and that's specifically, um, it, uh, Jennifer Lynn uh, Stover, uh, Stover has done um, has written a wonderful book on that um, uh, in 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 a different context, but I think it applies here as well. And then you have the colonial history of um, civilizing and disciplining noise, right? And then you have the remediation of noise through a film which invites us to uh, contemplate a new archival logic that destabilizes the knowledge that may have once found validation by way of the archive, right? Especially the colonial archive, okay? So noise, listening to noise in this film and, and other films as well um, presents a kind of different way of listening, right? Uh, and I'm very sorry that <laughs> I lingered on the introduction um, and I'm kind of rushing through now, but I'll leave that um, there. So essentially I go through these films and look at different ways in which um, the remediation of audio recordings and film uh, kind of destabilizes the way that we listen and the way that we listen to um, these recordings uh, through noise, but also um, through other means. So I'll just just some of my the, the books I mentioned um, in the talk, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Olivia. I have so many questions, but so um, <laughs> I'm going to hold back. Um, so we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, and as a reminder, you can post your questions using the Q and A button on the bottom of your screen, or you can um, drop questions in the chat. Um, so we can start off. Um, a question from Christina Stanchu, who came who came back to join us. I absolutely love this project and can't wait to read the book. I'm interested in learning more about the genealogy of the project, the original spark that generated it. Um, also, can you talk about the major archives you have decided to use or write alongside or against, and what advice you have for those interested in colonial sound archives? Thanks mm -hmm. and congratulations, Olivia. A really fascinating talk and book. Thank you, Christina. Um, I have to say, I mean, I'm a, a German scholar and a film scholar. So I came to this project through actually The Half Moon Files, watching uh, the documentary The Half Moon Files, which revisits the Berlin Sound Archive and becomes fascinated with this recording made by uh, Mal Singh. Uh, 
So, I, and at first I actually wanted to um, do kind of comprehensive archival work in the Berlin Sound Archive. I'll talk a little bit about that history. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, in 2019, Britta Lange's book uh, came out and uh, it, it is about just that. It's about the the recordings of the prisoner of, uh, prisoners of war uh, made th made through this commission made during um, World War One, and um, it's an it's it's an amazing book um, and just just a compilation of a decade of work in the archive. So I I realized that I, I couldn't do that. I you know I didn't want to just kind of um, pick up the same project. Uh, and I became interested in, and I've always been interested in the question of remediation, the, you know, taking kind of analog media and um, digitalizing them through a different um, media form. And so I kind of thought, well, maybe there are other films that have looked at or that have actually engaged with and used um, um, kind of audio files or audio recordings that were made in um, the kind of colonial context. And I was able to find a handful. Now this is a, this question uh, of, or the, this notion of remediation of co kind of colonial material is, has been done and has been considered to a larger extent with the visual, with photography and film. Um, May, photography and um, kind of films made during um, in in a colonial context that have been then uh, destabilized or uh, certainly remediated in a way that critiques um, critiques them through film, but it hasn't been done to such an extent with audio recordings. So um, so I didn't do an uh, I didn't do a significant amount of of uh, uh, archival work. There was also, of course, COVID that happened. I had a um, an Alexander von Humboldt fellowship to go to Germany and actually do some archival work. There was COVID, and then with the building of the Berlin, um, the the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, um, the kind of the Berliner Stadtschloss, there was um, there were plans to move a lot of these materials into the Forum, so they weren't available to um, examine anyway. But um, the the Berlin Sound Archive, um, which of, of which the largest collection is in fact um, the collection made through the commission, um, was located as within was located had many different kind of uh, um, homes, uh, but was first actually kind of subsumed by the Berlin Berliner Phonogram Archive, which was the second. Um, now I'm sorry, I'm probably this is becoming a long response. It was actually the second uh, sound archive uh, globally. Um, it was founded in 1900. The first one was founded in 1899 in Vienna. Um, and it, it, it contained mostly um, ethno, ethnographic, um, ethnomusic musicology kind of recording. So recordings of uh, traditional music. Um, and at first, much of the, um, much of the, many of the recordings were actually subsumed um, and, and put into the phonogram archive. And then eventually kind of um, found their way into their own archive. But I, I, it, it's a rather uh, convoluted history, but I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that because I'm talking too much and I'm sure other people have questions and comments, but thank you so much, Christina. We can talk more about this. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, this is meant to actually to generate discussion. So I'm sure um, of you, if you want to share your, um, your email, you can, um, people who have questions can also contact you, but we have a couple more questions. Jessica Trisco Darden asks, what are the technical requirements of this type of research? What technologies, if any, do you work with? Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, f um, no, nothing specific, I guess. But that's a great question, but no, I, I'm pretty, for my own, <laughs> my own research, uh, finding the films and getting copies of the films can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but otherwise, um, no, no. I'm... Okay. Um, we have a final question from Ivy Worsham, who writes, thank you so much, Olivia. 
I can point to images still and moving that have stayed with me for various reasons, beauty, startling, repulsive, etc., as well as particular pieces of music. I'm curious what noises, if any, from your research have really stayed with you um, that you can easily access in your mind um, and why. That's a really um, interesting question. I think that um, one of the... Um, One of the paths that's been important for me as well um, in thinking about how sound um, really does kind of shape, um, really shape our knowledge and our approach to knowledge in a way that um, can be um, very colonial, but also very, um, very discriminatory. Uh, it has been at an important has been very important for me to really reevaluate how I how I approach sound, how I perceive sound, um, how I judge sound. Um, you know what what tells me that something is noise. Um, and of course, it's interesting. We think about the etymology of noise comes from nausea, right? So that what is what is what sounds make me uneasy and why? you know, what, where does that come from? Um, how is that part of my own kind of cultural, um, uh, cultural socialization? Um, so there's been an important unlearning process for me uh, in terms of my own perception of, of sound and noise. Thank you. Thank you. I actually didn't know that about the etymology. That's really fascinating that you could do a lot with that, huh? Mm -hmm. um, so we and have ships for... <laughs> now <Yes. Yes. laughs> um, and movement okay so um so mary kate and lingold has um we have time i think for this final question thanks for sharing your fascinating research i'm curious to know what is your favorite of the films that you work on or do you have an idea of what an ideal creative engagement with these sound archives would be or do in terms of decolonizing listening and destabilizing the tropes entailed in the artifacts mm -hmm. right um, I guess uh, my favorite films are probably from the, my favorites are from here to here and uh, the half moon files. Um, and that those are the films that were kind of instigated my initial research. And that's probably why this, the history of um, the prisoner of war camps and the, the anthropological work um, that was going on is a history that is not well known. Um, you know, it's only, a lot of kind of, at least within the German context, a lot of um, much of the history of World War One is military history, um, and a lot of that the history of World War One has been kind of not forgotten, but at least um, marginalized um, because, of course, you know, then then came World War Two, right? Um, so a lot of our kind of uh, preoccupation. Um, and interest is taken up uh, with thinking about World War II. And it was only uh, at the kind of centennial of the start of, of um, World War I that a lot of new research, especially cultural kind of heritage research, um, was initiated in the early part of um, the 2000s. And so this, this kind of work started to develop and it's really fascinating actually but in terms of decolonizing um actually there's a really the really interesting question of like how can i i don't i i use decolonizing but i use it cautiously because i understand that um decolonization especially within indigenous studies is very much um inspired by activist efforts for reparation especially um land reparation, reclaiming stewardship over land. Um, and this is not obviously that what I'm doing, right? And my, my kind of approach to decolonization is really kind of epistemological. Um, it's really about unlearning certain processes. But um, there has been talk with um, recently, especially uh, in the German context, the French context, there have been movements to... Um, of rest of restitution of uh, uh, cultural heritage artifacts, um, especially to African countries from which they were stolen. 
And uh, what happens with recordings? You know, can is that is that really something tangible that can be repatriated or can be um, you know returned? Um, do you you know do can can these records be returned? And there have been efforts to find, um, especially like for example in the case of Mal Singh, but others to kind of find family members who um, you know might be you know, interested or curious about these objects um, and to at least kind of uh, kind of make that connection. Um, but the question of, yeah, what do you do with sound recordings? Is it is it an object that you can return? So that, thank you for that question. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, and thanks again to Olivia um, for sharing this um, amazing project. Um, I hope we can continue to have conversations about your research. Um, so quickly, everyone, uh, please join us for Living Legacies, Navigating Medicine with Dr. Philip E.B. Bird Jr. at noon tomorrow and on March 12th, looking ahead for the panel where HRC residential fellows will present their research um, in, a um, in a panel called uh, Medicine, Marginalization and Resistance, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. All the information um, for registration is on the um, HRC website. Um, thanks again to Olivia. Um, and thanks again, for everyone, Thank for joining so us much. today.